On Five News tonight, the Calais migrant camp is cleared. A breakthrough in autism treatment and the Heathrow controversy continues. M much of the camp, known as the jungle, is now ablaze or destroyed. France says the operation to remove the migrants is over. How a new method of training parents is helping children with autism have a better life. I think that the idea that we could interact with therapists and learn from them to become not just good parents, but super parents. I mean, it is, it is proper super parenting. And Theresa May is challenged by one of her own MPs of her plans to expand Heathrow. Also tonight, I'll be joined by an ex-offender to discuss the rehabilitation of young criminals. And do you know your neighbours? We'll be talking to the man who created Hollyoaks about why so many of us have bad relations with the people next door. Good evening, welcome to Five News Tonight. I'm Matt Barbet. It was home to up to 7,000 people, many of them desperate to come to Britain. But the Calais camp, known as the Jungle, has now been officially cleared. The last of those who've been living there have been removed, but some who've refused to board buses to reception centres remain in the area. The authorities hope it marks the end of the notorious camp. For those migrants, though, the future remains anything but certain, as Simon Viger reports. Day three and the fires burned out of control. The Calais authorities say the camp is now clear. They've been tearing down the shacks, but the fire does much the same job. Black smoke from burning tarpaulins filling the air. The council denies it started the fires. Some officials blame anarchists who've based themselves in the jungle, while others say some of the migrants did it. This government official says the community leaders have told us that it's a tradition which is very established. When you go, you burn. The problem is all of the cooking gas cylinders in the shacks. Some have exploded, so that is slowing the rest of the demolition. Outside the camp, some try to get onto the refugee list for the UK, while most are bussed to other centres within France. There have been several camps over the years, all of them causing tension and a blame game between France and the UK. At its worst, lorry drivers were being blockaded and attacked as people tried to stow away. The jungle grew up on a landfill site near the road to the ferries. The official population was between six and 7,000, but no one really knew, and the charities thought it was much higher, with hundreds of unaccompanied children. Today, this apocalyptic scene is more reminiscent of a war zone. As the fires were put out, a few migrants went back in. But this is the end. The people of Calais have finally got what they wanted, but whether it will stop the port being a magnet is very much in doubt. Simon Viger, Five News. Now, a groundbreaking study is offering new hope to parents of children with autism. It doesn't involve any sort of medicine. Instead, scientists filmed mums and dads playing with their child. They then watched the footage back and gave tips on what they could do better. It is known as super parenting. And as our chief correspondent, Tessa Chapman, reports now, the results have been dramatic. Sophia is a chatty young girl now, but at the age of three, her autism meant she couldn't speak. The transformation's been remarkable, and her mum puts it down to a trial therapy as a toddler. They were filmed together during play sessions. Then Olga viewed the footage with experts who gave her feedback and tips to use at home. I could see that um, the observation of my child with the help of a specialist was teaching me so much and then the realization that, you know, you're a carer, not only a parent, you're a carer for somebody who is special or different mm. and just fantastic results. The year-long trial involved 152 families with children aged between two and four. Half of the families were given the usual therapies. 50% of those children were severely autistic at the beginning and that percentage increased as expected to 63% six years later. But the opposite happened in the families given the intensive training. 55% of the children were severely autistic at the beginning, falling to 46% at the end of the study. The researchers who designed the trial are delighted. Children with autism communicate in an unusual way. 
and it can be very perplexing for even the best parent can find this perplexing. So this isn't anything to do with uh, uh, parents not being good enough. This is about creating really enriched super parents, you know, parents who are really doing better than average to really cope with this challenge. Autism affects one in a hundred people. TV presenter Carrie Grant's daughter Imogen is one of them. A diagnosis can be daunting, but they say this study offers hope. It probably took us about five years to really fully understand what it was we were dealing with. Wouldn't it be nice if someone who's really experienced in all of this could just tell you that on day one so that you could start feeling, OK, I'm getting equipped immediately. And hopefully that will lead to less interventions being needed later on. Researchers stress they haven't discovered a cure, but they have found a vital piece of the jigsaw in a complex condition. Tessa Chapman, Five News. With me now is Carol Povey from the National Autistic Society and also Emma Selwyn, who was diagnosed with autism when she was four years old. Good evening to you both. And it's interesting, this, Emma, because it shows just how much of an influence, how important parents are in dealing with children who have autism. How much of an impact did your parents have on you and helping you come to terms with it? Um... Well, my mum raised me and my brother near enough single-handed. Um, to be honest, I think the things that have probably influenced um, my functioning conventionally, if you like, uh, helping me function normally, would be uh, the fact that I've always been interested in performance and creativity. Yeah. So I think... You can be the best parents in the world, but if you're not prepared uh, to allow your child to uh, be creative, then that's not going to help the child. And I think a multi a multifaceted approach is imperative. So don't just focus on speech. Focus on writing, reading, drawing, dance, movement. It could be any of those things. Mm. Um, I mean... I've been doing various drama and performance arts classes yeah. uh, since, uh, well, from a young age. But uh, most recently, I've been participating in a performance making diploma uh, with Access All Areas at the Royal Central School of uh, Speech and Drama. You're making great strides then. And let me just ask Carol, I mean, of course, Enabling their kids to do what their kids are really good at and want to do is, well, it's good advice for all parents, but particularly those parents who've, whose children have been diagnosed with the condition autism, it, we now know it's vital. Yes, yes. Often straight after diagnosis, parents really struggle to, to understand how best to, to support and, mm -hmm. and bring out the best in their child. Um, and, and this research is, is great because it recognises the role that, that parents have to play in, in the development of their child. And it's about that partnership between professionals and parents and how perhaps professionals can help parents to, to really be able to focus on their child's um, needs and development. And the perception of the wider world of what autism is, it's, it's a different way of experiencing the world, isn't it, Emma? And mm -hmm. And I think that's another part of this, particularly in girls, in females, about how underdiagnosed autism is, and there are lessons being learnt there all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of the reason that many defab people, many women and people assumed to be female at birth, are not diagnosed or misrepresented uh, is because... Uh, there's so much emphasis on be a good girl, um, smile, look pretty, all that kind of thing. So gender stereotypes. Oh, completely, completely. Mm -hmm. But then you've also got to think about um, people from... Uh, I'm trying to think of how to put this without sounding... With different backgrounds, maybe? Yeah, different backgrounds. Saying? So, okay. like, uh, certain cultures um, might think... Like, they might say that the child is behaving badly um, or that um, it's the parent's fault. Yes. When... when it's not. <laughs> Let's just say the refrigerator mother theory was disproved. 
Okay. Decades ago. Decades ago. Let me just finish by asking Carol, and that, and that is the vital part about this, of course. I mean, this, you know, you were telling me just earlier that this is the tip of the iceberg. It's closing that gap between diagnosis and helping deal with the condition that has to come next. That's right. Um, f firstly, people need to be able to get timely diagnosis as soon as they recognise that their child might be de developing differently. So diagnosis is really important. And then it's really important that all families get the support that they need as soon as possible after diagnosis. OK, Carol, Emma, thank you both very much indeed. For thank you. On. Thank you. Now, the speculation may have been ended, but the fallout from the decision to expand Heathrow Airport continues. At Prime Minister's Question Time today, Theresa May was challenged by one of her own MPs over its environmental impact. Well, there's also a fierce by-election battle in store after the resignation of another Tory MP yesterday. Our political editor, Andy Bell, has the story. The day after the Heathrow decision and the problems are stacking up. For the first time, we heard from the Prime Minister, put on the Thank spot you. today by one of her Part own of MPs, well demanding well the, uh, to know, the know the if anyone had looked at the environmental assessments that go with this decision. We took extra time to look at those. That was from the uh, decision to take increased airport capacity in the South East. We wanted to look more particularly at the air quality issues. The evidence shows that air quality standards can be met as required by all three of the schemes, including the North West Runway at Heathrow. An answer dismissed by another Conservative MP who's resigned to force a by-election. And we will see, I believe, in a few weeks' time that people will come out in force and they will vote against Heathrow expansion. This is fundamentally a referendum on Heathrow expansion. Well, that's what you would like it, you'd like it to be, that. Well, Isn't there a danger that it can turn into something else? Uh, I, I don't think there is. I think it's very clear. I mean, I've initiated this. I've triggered the by-election very clearly on the back of a decision made by government. Zach Goldsmith says he wants to make this by-election a referendum on them. But is it really going to be that simple? The Liberal Democrats also oppose Heathrow expansion but want to make this by-election about government plans for leaving the EU. The damage done to jobs across London, across the country, but particularly in this constituency and to livelihoods in general, is absolutely immense. And the way to send a message to Theresa May about not just Heathrow, but about the direction our country is wrongly taking, is to back the Liberal Democrats. So what do the voters think? Is it about Heathrow? It is a referendum on that question because it's an issue that really concerns this community. It really concerns me. There goes the plane now. Can you even hear me speaking? That's our problem. For what? I mean, you can't. I mean, they won't defeat the, the airport. It'll go through in the end. It shouldn't be about Brexit at all. Okay. And he's a very, very good constituency MP. However, it turns out this by-election won't be enough to stop Heathrow expansion, but it might just be part of something bigger, which prevents a smooth landing for this government plan. Andy Bell, 5 News. Still to come on 5 News tonight. Why flushing wipes down the toilet like this is costing millions and misery in clearing blockages. And recognition at last, Hugh Laurie finally makes his mark on Hollywood's walk of fame. Now Hugh will spend eternity having chewing gum and dog poo trodden into him. A little bit more Fry and Laurie after the break. Welcome back. You're watching 5 News tonight. There's a warning that more people will become victims of crime unless the system for dealing with young adult criminals is overhauled. According to a report by the Commons Justice Committee, the needs of 18 to 25-year-old offenders are not being addressed. MPs say those in that age group offend the most, but also have the most potential to stop offending. Joining me now is Cordell Cabey from User Voice, an organisation which works with offenders and ex-offenders to support them through their rehabilitation. And Cordell, that's because you got in a bit of trouble yourself when you were growing up. I absolutely did. Um, I was involved in gangs um, growing up in Birmingham. Um, I mean, you know, it wasn't anything too serious, but um, I, I, I got into a, a, fair little bit, a fair bit of trouble um, growing up. One of the things they say in this report is that the brain is still developing in young men until the age of 25, mm -hmm. which some people say, well, that's not news to me. But the fact that they've acknowledged this, do you think could lead to differences in approach to 
young men who might be potential reoffenders? Absolutely. I think, first of all, it's great that this report has come out. I think it's, it's excellent that they're beginning to look um, at, at, at this area. Um, I think it's been much needed, um, and it, it's needed the publicity. I think, you know, I work with young people on a, on a daily basis, and I, I see their maturity levels. You know, some appear um, to be um, 19, 20 years of age, but actually they have a maturity level of, of only 14 and 15, or 15. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's a, you know, that's, that's a worry because they're being treated as adults and yet really, in, in, in effect, they're actually um, young people. Do you know, whether they're on the wrong side of the law or the right side, everyone will know that young lads can be a bit gung-ho with life in general. How do you get them to recognise that in themselves and act a bit more maturely and act like, and realise there are, um, there's going to be consequences to their actions? Absolutely, and and I think again, you know, as a, you know, working with young people on on a on a on a daily basis, I'm reminding them that I was an ex-offender. I've been in trouble. Um, you know, recognizing that young people will make mistakes. That it happens. Um, it's about putting those mistakes right. Um, but it's it, it's giving them the platform. I feel that you know what we do at our organisation is we give young people a platform um, to 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 talk. You know, to improve the services, to feel that they're a part of the services that re that they're receiving. Um, and so I feel like if they've got people and, and influences in their life that can actually show them, well, actually, I can turn my life around. I can go on to live a, a crime-free life. Yes. Then th th we need to make that more available to young people. And just briefly, a lot of it is being learnt in prison or young offenders institutions to, to, to do the same thing again and make the same mistakes again. If you would do one thing that you think would prevent that, what would it be? I think the key to it is... is I believe, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a, a scientist and, and it's great that they're looking into the science behind this. But, you know, speaking to young people, I believe that, that the employment is, is key and the criminal records and, 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 and the treatment of, of ex-offenders and, and young offenders. And the stereotypes around that um, needs to change. You give them something to do. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well Good to see you, mate. Thank Thanks you. for coming in. Brilliant. Thank you. Next, the two UKIP MEPs who are involved in an altercation at the European Parliament have been referred to the French police. The former leadership favourite Stephen Wolfe was left in hospital after the incident three weeks ago. Mike Hookham denies hitting him. This afternoon, UKIP has formally reprimanded Mr Hookham but said he can't be held fully responsible. Vodafone has been fined more than four and a half million pounds for breaching consumer protection rules. The communications watchdog found it wasn't handling customer complaints properly and it failed to credit 10,000 pay-as-you-go customers accounts after they had been topped up. The pay gap between men and women in the UK is at its narrowest for nearly 20 years. Over the past 12 months, the difference in wages fell to just under 10%. But campaigners say that gap is closing at a snail's pace. Now, they're blighting our beaches, blocking our sewers and costing tens of millions of pounds a year to clean up. And there are calls for urgent action on wet wipes. Conservationists say even though many brands claim to be flushable, they are in fact causing big problems. Olivia Kinsley has been finding out some of the unpleasant truths. Britain's love of wet wipes grows and grows. They're quick, convenient, but potentially a huge problem if you put them down the loo. Every day at these sewage works in Reading, Barry pulls blockages from the pipes. He says it's mostly wet wipes. This is what he's collected just since last night. Now water companies and charities want all wet wipes to be labelled do not flush. It depends what you term by flushable. Um, I'm sure there's many things that you or I could try and flush down the toilet that I wouldn't call flushable, be it my pen, these glasses. And that's the real problem, is that these wet wipes, they go down the sewer and therefore they combine with the fats, the oils, the greases to form those hard fat bergs and that's what leads to the blockages. In the UK, up to 80% of blockages are caused by wet wipes and other unflushable items. This costs water companies and taxpayers £88 million a year to clean up. In 2015, the Marine Conservation Society found more than 50 wet wipes per mile of coastline. That's a rise of 400% over the past decade. This is standard toilet paper. Put it into water. Give it a shake. You can see it dissolves pretty quickly. 
This, on the other hand, is a wet wipe which said flushable on the label. It's already been in here for about 10 minutes. And if we take it out, take a look, you can see it's still intact. The body that represents wet wipe manufacturers says there's no proof it's the ones labelled flushable causing the problems. In fact, the EDANA says the answer is consumer education. To avoid confusion, probably best to put them in the bin. Olivia Kinsley, Five News. As one of Britain's best-loved soap opera says, everyone needs good neighbours. You know who that's from, don't you? But it would seem that's far from the reality for many of us. New research has found almost 20% of British people have been involved in a dispute with their neighbours. More than half wouldn't regard their neighbours as friends, and 12% wouldn't even know them if they bumped into them in the street, presumably outside their house. I'm joined now by TV producer Phil Redmond. And Phil, you use communities and neighbours as inspiration for some of your most successful shows, Brookside and Hollyoaks, of course, set in Chester. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised by this? Um, <clears throat> well, not really, because when in 19, um, 1982, when I actually started Brookie, one of the things I wanted to do was to uh, signal the change away from the, you know, cooey, it's only me, you know, it's popping in for a cup of sugar and things. And um, that people were now moving towards uh, mixed developments where they wanted a bit more privacy, yeah. you know. And we made a conscious decision right at the beginning that we would not have a central set like the, uh, the Rovers or the Queen Vic, because even in 1982, kids wouldn't be seen dead, you know, um, going to the same pub as their parents. So. I think that was the start of it, and I think it's kind of uh, just carried on that way, really. You know, and some of the research out today, you know, which is one of the things I've kind of like been helping support from the yeah. co-op and neighbourhood watches, is about the way uh, it seems to be a gender gap now. So you find that the younger people under 35 yeah. are the ones who don't know the neighbours, never been inside their houses, and all that kind of thing. But people above that seem to be a little bit more confident about saying, hey, hi, I'm your neighbour, who are you? Uh, you know? Even so, on Brookside, they still used to congregate in the clothes and chat to each other and play football and, you know, occasionally have a bit of a street party or, or whatever. You say that there's that age gap there. Is it the case that, that age gap is getting older or, or when people settle down and maybe have a family over the age of 35, to be very general about it, then they start to take an interest? Yeah, I think it's all those kind of things, the social glue that brings us together. I mean, in the soaps, yeah, sure, you bring all your characters together because the reality of the fiction is you have to make the programme within the resources. Yeah. So you manufacture these moments when people come together. But it, in real life, it's these things like, you know, church, schools and things that bring it together, especially when you've got kids, you start taking your kids to school and then you start to meet friends through your, your children's friends. Yeah. And then they obviously go to the same place and everything, so they become your neighbours and things like that. So it starts. I mean, we, look, we hear about pubs closing down all the time, yeah. every week. You know, fewer people perhaps yeah. going to church or other places of worship that, that they used to. What do you think is the social glue now that should get neighbours to know each other? Is it, is it just taking the online delivery for someone? <laughs> well, perhaps Amazon's going to be the new glue. <laughs> taking the package. I'm sure they would like that. Take your package in for your neighbour and get to know them and things, but. I don't know, we're in a strange area too because digital technology is something else because uh, obviously again, on the age under 35, that's all they've grown up with. So as soon as they get up in the morning, the earbuds go in, they'll start looking at the phone, off they go. They're more interested in their digital friends than people right next door to them. However, the other thing we're finding are things from people like Neighbourhood Watch is now people are using that same technology to create neighbourhood apps, you know, and email groups, you know, about what's going on in the neighbourhood. So perhaps we're in a transitional phase, really. You know? See, that's an interesting thing. They might not be sort of twitching the curtains, yeah. but they might be going online to keep an eye on what their neighbours are up to. They're that's still right. interested. That's right. And I think what we find uh, when we have things like last year with all the floods and things, I mean, yeah. you end up, you know, that old cliche about the blitz spirit all coming back together. People want an excuse to help out, don't That's they? exactly, you know. And when I, I'm chairing UK City of Culture, each city that gets that award, like Hall 2017, yes. it's got a year of opportunity to actually try something and experiment and actually talk to people and get to know them. So I think what you're saying there is if you're in Hull, you've got no excuse not to know your neighbours. <laughs> all right, really good to see you, Phil. Thanks for coming <laughs> in. Thank you.
Now, there have been some goings on at Hollywood's Walk of Fame. This is how the star belonging to Donald Trump looks this evening after someone apparently took a sledgehammer to it. LA police say it happened around 6 o'clock in the morning local time and they don't yet have a suspect or a motive. They're not saying if it's connected to his controversial campaign to become US president. Perhaps they don't need to. But a little bit further up Hollywood Boulevard, there's a new star in town, or rather, a new star belonging to an old favourite. Hugh Laurie has entertained audiences on both sides of the Atlantic down the years, and he's now been given his own honour alongside his partner in crime, and that damaged one. Minnie Stevenson has more. Hugh Laurie! Now, Hugh Laurie may be famously humble, but there is no denying your star status once Hollywood has set your name in stone. But despite reaching the dizzy heights of the Walk of Fame, Hugh still remembered his roots and his novelty socks. I read fearful news in this morning's paper. Oh, no. Not another little cat caught up in a tree. <laughs> Of course, it was in British comedy that the actor made his name. How can you forget his bumbling Prince George in Blackadder? From the UK to LA, Hugh said he could not believe he'd cracked America. I don't know if you Yanks fully understand what this means to someone who was born and raised 5,000 miles away from here, who for the first 30 years of his life only only knew anything of this country because of the records I, I listened to and the films I saw and the television shows I watched. That's all I knew. Where exactly are you? If anyone should happen to ask, I'm at an out-of-state medical conference until further notice. Hughes Hollywood star comes after his 12-year success as a bad-tempered doctor in the US TV series House. It not only won him an army of American fans, but two Golden Globes. Who told you that you were naked? <laughs> You may have lost me there, Arnold. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how globally famous you are, you can always rely on your comedy partner from the Fry and Laurie days to keep you grounded. And so we come here to the epicentre of the entertainment capital of the world, the very eye of the galaxy, where it is the tradition in this marvellous town to reward stars by bringing them right down to earth, so far down to earth, that now Hugh will spend eternity having chewing gum and dog poo trodden into him. Got a girl? No, sir. All alone. Well, I suppose we all are in the end, aren't we? The star who recently went to the dark side as a bad guy in The Night Manager you know, has become one of the highest paid actors on US away, TV. Yeah, and it's worth noting that Hugh's Hollywood star is right by a British pub. So in the bright lights of LA, he'll always feel at home. Minnie Stevenson, Five News. After a bit of frying lorry, all that's left for me to say is soupy twist. That's it from us. Sean Welby has the weather next, and Danny is here with updates throughout the evening here on Channel 5. For now, thanks for your company. Bye-bye.